Welcome back to the $1 million to Big Point podcast. I am so pumped. We've got Nicole Schmid on it. And if you don't know this, Nicole, I actually was on Nicole's um, podcast, The Serial Entrepreneur. So we're going to put that up on my webpage soon. I've been promoting it, but soon I'm going to have a page just for like podcast interviews that I've been on. And Nicole is a serial entrepreneur. So I think this is going to be a fun interview for people to listen to because there's, there's those of us out there who just can't help starting something new and doing it again. And seeing if we fail or if we succeed. That's just what we love to do. So do you want to start an online business using your corporate experience? You should head over to corporate to contract and download my 14 day sprint to starting your business. And it's a guide to jump starting your freelance business. If you love the podcast, don't forget to sign up for the tipping jar of wisdom, where as a subscriber, you get access to exclusive content every Thursday, straight to your inbox with actionable tasks from our guests like Nicole, that will help you grow your business. So head over, connect with me on Instagram at virtually Kiri or LinkedIn, Kiri Mohan. I am the only one. So Nicole, hello. Nicole Schmid is a four-time entrepreneur and the CEO and founder of Smart Cookie Media and the creator of the podcast, The Serial Entrepreneur Show, which we had just talked about. So she knows what it's like to have a few balls in the air. Through workshops and done-for-you services, her team creates marketing results in as little as a day. From business owners, politicians, and other go-getters, she has worked with clients across the U.S., Canada, and Australia. Nicole is a first-generation American who lives outside of Chicago in Northwest Indiana with her husband, Kyle, and their two sons, Luke and Will. So, Nicole, hello. Welcome again. Thanks so much, Kiri, for having me. Excited to be here. I am also a first-generation American. My parents are both immigrants. Yes. So, where are your parents from? Uh, My dad's from Mexico. Well, so he... He's first generation on his side, but I'm first generation. My mom was, uh, was born in Scotland. So she still holds, she still holds, um, her, she still holds her alien card. Right. So she's residential. She's here. She's with us. And the last time she flew, she's like, I may let it go now that the queen's gone. I might, uh, I might just become a citizen, but she's just always, I could never denounce the queen. Oh, interesting. I thought there was like a lot of hatred though, between Scots and the English and the British. So it, it's about being British, right? Like, so you're a British citizen. So even though there is some animosity in between the countries, um, it's about being a British citizen. That's what your passport says when you are. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, Mexican first generation, on my dad's side, and then my mom, me being the first one born in, you can imagine talk about some heated discussions. They're divorced now for a good reason. <laughs> I, mean, excuse me, I feel like that's like two different culturally, like the yes. personalities in both those cultures have got to be so different in like your fighting style and your working style. And yes. Everything. Oh my gosh. Yes. They are the best of buddies though. I will, I will say that even to this oh, day, it's them. been really sweet. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, good. That is good to hear. I got to grab my battery. I'm sorry. I thought it was plugged in. No, sorry. I had, I had help this morning to get plugged in, but he failed. That's all right. We can cut it out. Okay. Much better. So where are your parents from? My parents and my dad is actually from Australia and my mom is from Italy. Um, my mom moved here when she was 13. My dad was traveling around the world doing, you know, like an extended gap years, I guess, working in different places. And, um, he met my mom and they got married very quickly because he had to, you know, the green card situation and all that, and they are still together. So oh, it's been a long I time. It. I feel those temperaments would work together well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I guess so. <laughs> They're still together. I think. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Smart Cookie Media and your business and where it is right now, what you do. Yeah. So Smart Cookie Media, we work to help service-based entrepreneurs. So think portrait photographers. That's probably, that's probably a large part of my business is a whole lot of portrait photographers, right? They got all the lighting, the equipment, the big studios all across the country and a couple in Canada too. And we help any type of service-based business owner really create a marketing plan. That's like a, like a faucet that you can turn on and off. We want to give, um, the, you know, the inner need for control. Sometimes we want to give that back to people. And so we do that through helping them read their data better. Inner need for control. I've got a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. You might, you might nickname yourself, you know, I got a little control freak. 
And that's the type of person we want to take care of because you can, you really, really can. It doesn't have to be this uh, ebb and flow, this, this, you know, peaks and valleys uh, now through data. We have so much of it now. I grew up as an entrepreneur's kid and we had none of it. We, we mm. just like, you put a flyer at the door, you put a sign in the yard and you hoped and you prayed and you hoped and you prayed, but now we can just follow it. What are customers doing all over the internet, all over this place? that's just like in our pocket, as soon as we want to pull out our phone. And when we can follow them and understand that data, what it, what it's really telling us, just a few key metrics, we can give our inner control freak mm. a little more control, like a water faucet, you know, turn on the leads, turn them off. You want to go to, you want to go to Italy or Australia for the month and, and, and feel confident that you can, that you're not gonna be tied to your phone or your laptop. You can do that. Mm. So give us an example of your best case study. Oh, my favorite. Uh, I love giving a best one because even sometimes I don't believe it. And so I've had to actually look at it like a case study. My team was like, surely we got to get these numbers down. And so they, they <laughs> my team encouraged, and we did. And the, the one is Angie. She is a portrait photographer out of Houston. And when she came to me, she was already working with a marketing agency. And we met inside one of my workshops. It was a free workshop through another portrait photographer. And I, uh, I was really, really, really pregnant in the middle of a pandemic. I had just come off of a congressional campaign, uh, helping a candidate win his congressional seat at breakneck speed. But guess what? When you're I pregnant- saw that on your site, <laughs> by the way, for our listeners, you should see that. I guess it's a case study or that testimony or whatever it was, the, the politician who won yeah, his campaign, won. that was cool because of your work. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, yeah. Uh, underfunded congressman. That's a good one too. Underfunded. I mean, we're talking what I can do with a dollar a day and ads budget is, uh, is, is a lot of fun. Really, really powerful. So, uh, so Angie came to me and I was very, very pregnant. So there was me trying to figure out how was I going to, how was I going to work my business? I went from like literally shaking hands and, and, you know, being right next to the candidate to, okay, no, nobody lets me go anywhere besides an OB appointment. Right. And uh, I came up with this idea of like, okay, I can do a VIP day. And so, um, she, she left her agency unbeknownst to me. I'd had no idea. And I had a baby and then she was like, Hey, I'm ready to work with you now. And I said, great. And she was at 117 K a year. So just over the hundred K mark. And, uh, I was like, Oh, where do you want to go? What do you, what do you want to do? What's the goals? And from there within 10 months, cause right when you're a mom, everything's in months of your kids. By the yes. time my little guy was, <laughs> he was a little over 10 months. Cause she and I started working just a little after he was born. But when, uh, when it, we hit 10 months together, we added 106 to her business. We wanted to know wow. right, the, right, the right moment of a hundred thousand. So we, we looked up at 106 and from there, man, we just kept doing the work. And this all started because of VIP day. She was one of the original VIP days. She trusted me with the day. And from there, a couple other projects along the way, a couple other VIP days that got added uh, because of Angie. She's really, she's really been like, hands up, like what I need this too. And we've done that. And now today, so 24 months after that, she, um, I was actually in, I was in Houston and um, she was like, oh my gosh, I just got off the phone. I just hit a four. I just hit 400 K for the year. So I was 24 months into working together. And wow. since then, I mean, she's, she's on her way to 500 K this year easily. She's, she's doing amazing. Maybe. So more. what did you do? Did you do ads? Did you work with her on her social media strategy? Like what was it specifically that you think so really that, propelled her forward? So it is a really clear ad strategy that is just destined to win because we pay attention to long-term metrics early. So we battle tested her Facebook ads, new Facebook ads. We looked at what was working in the past and what wasn't for her applied my method of, of looking at certain metrics that can keep it long-term. She didn't have to pay me a monthly retainer, right? I wasn't even sure how that would work with no childcare anyhow, right? I couldn't do how I was doing it before. So it was that day she had 30 days support. Of course, you know, I tell all my clients reach out anytime from there. We did do um, an SEO project that was longer than that um, building out, you know, building a whole lot of blogs, but it is those ads that have run for 12 months and then have run for 18 months and continue to bring her just a stream of leads and, or a stream of people that may not click the button. Cause let's face it. Those of us that pay for ads, sometimes we don't want to click the button. Cause we're like, somebody pays for that. I don't want to pay. I've done that. I'm not going to click the button. Yeah. I'm not going to click the Google ads. Someone has to pay for that click. I'll just go to their website. And so uh, then on her website, we're just seeing people say like, I've been seeing you all over my feed. You know, I started stalking you on Instagram. Like, I love the things that they say to her because we know it's about her being visible in a, in a meaningful way. Mm. What do you suggest to other people that want to look at, you know, ads and marketing and what do you suggest to them to help grow their business? in a meaningful yeah. way when maybe it's just them, maybe they're, they don't yeah. have $107,000 when they're starting off in their business yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, and Angie would tell you too, that, that she didn't either. And that she, I mean, she was going from paying somebody thousands of dollars a month 
to then not, she just had to pay one day with me. Right. And the VIP mm. day didn't, it was half of what it is now that that's true, but we, we've understood the power now, right? We can flex that power where you're saving so much money annually. So I would say, um, there is a right budget to get a whole lot of visibility and you need to, you need to determine what that is. So even if you're starting out at zero, guess what? We all did. We, we all did. And one of my favorite things to tell people is to invest in your investments and you are that investment. So mm. whether it is, like I mentioned, even the candidate, a, a candidate who is underfunded, like, um, I'm not big, I'm not, I'm not here to preach any politics, but like, if there was a guy that you wanted to win, this was the guy, but he was, he was way underfunded. He came to the race late, um, by all accounts, you know, he had an uphill battle and we knew, um, if we could flex a dollar a day, if we could flex, um, a couple dollars a day, of course, we could be in the pockets of everybody. And so whether you're like Angie and you're like, I got 700 bucks a month or a thousand dollars a month. Or you're like, you know what? I, I at least have 30 bucks. There's a way that you can make those metrics work for you. That's amazing. I, I'm going to start getting into ads soon with my business. And I'm very fascinated in it because everyone says it's like everyone. Most people say it's a, a good way just to bring leads in, just to bring people looking at your stuff. And um, for our audience, if you are interested in learning more about VIP days, I interviewed Sarah Massey. I think yeah, the, I love Sarah Massey. Yeah, yeah, I think it's called Day by Day day by day. I'm pretty sure Sarah Massey and creating day rates is what yes. the episode's call. You, you guys should go back and listen to it. She just explains in depth about VIP days and day rates yeah. and how to get clients interested in that. And she teaches a whole course on it. So she does. She does. Yeah, she definitely. I started that. creating them before her course even was born. Otherwise I would have bought it, but like, it was just like just starting. And, um, but I just was thinking, that's all I, that's all my options are right now. <laughs> my yeah. husband can give me a day and, and I fill those up. And the beauty is it creates demand and scarcity for what you offer yeah. in an easy way. You don't have to feel, you don't have to feel any way about sales. It, the calendar is the calendar and your, and your clients understand that. Were you really stressed since you had just come off of like childbirth and oh, yeah. it was your second, I think you said. <laughs> it was my second. second. Yeah. Yeah. Started, yeah. My other guy was How soon did you half. start working after you gave birth? Um, I don't think I ever stopped. There was always something I wanted to be doing, right? Like <laughs> I published to Amazon from the love seat of my couch while I don't even think he napped for more than 47 minutes <laughs> when, he, yeah. when he entered the world. Um, but it was like this desire, like I have to create and do something. And even that means I can't get to a desk. So I started publishing some things just, just to just kind of uh, give myself, you know, some people crochet, I wasn't going to crochet. Uh, that, that's what I, that's what I did. But I would say that exact example of the VIP day started in November of 2020. Oh, so. very cool. I also, um, so this, my second born, I decided I was going to take a significant amount of time off my first born. I had just started my business. I think it was like seriously got pregnant. Like when I quit my full-time job, maybe two or three months later. And I was like, I could only take six weeks off max. I think I was working after like four weeks just trying to figure stuff out. And this time around, I was like, you know what? My my business is more automated. I'm more, it's good. I'm more confident. I'm going to take four months off. <laughs> this podcast was born during that time off because clearly I cannot sit yeah. and do nothing for four yeah. months. So yeah. in my head, yeah. I thought that was going to be a great thing. I was like already like itching to do just something new and something different with what, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So I was in a corporate life with my first and I had the same six weeks that you mentioned. My guy was a NICU baby. So yeah. every bit of the plan went out the window. Mm -hmm. And so this time around, I did say like, okay, I will sit. I'll at least sit on the love seat. <laughs> like I'll at least be with them both. But the world was crazy, right? You know, yep. there was, uh, there was no family coming over there, even though they're only like 19 minutes away there. It was just an isolating time. So mama yeah. had to keep her mind busy for sure. My, my kiddo was born 2022, early 2022. And that was like the Omicron or something. And <laughs> there was no one allowed in the hospital room. Right. So like, yes. we, we definitely had visitors afterwards, but there's no one allowed in the hospital room. And I actually kind of liked it. It was very yeah. relaxing. Um, <laughs> I do want to talk about your magazine briefly, because you've been sending them to me ever since I was on your podcast and I love getting them. Where did awesome. you get this idea? Oh, and by the way, I shared one of the articles in it with my group coaching. We are working on the cohorts, working on unique value propositions. Actually, we're meeting again next Wednesday. And I sent them the article because your magazine awesome. came in and, with the, and I was yeah. like, oh my God, perfect timing. So supported thank you in that way. Um, oh, tell me about you. the magazine and where the idea came from, because I love it and I do look forward to it. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Well, um, I will drop the affiliate link because that's what it is. It is something that makes me look that good that, um, I remember the first time somebody else got it, that was closer to me. I don't know if there was a brand new team member or not, 
She's like, when do you have time for this? And I was like, oh, friend, I don't, I don't, I don't, I get to, I get to curate a few pieces, um, but there's a team somewhere else that does, that does it all for me. And um, yeah, so it's called Reminder Media that comes from my mortgage background of maybe a million years ago, uh, 2005, six, or 2006, seven. And uh, we, there was this, there's exactly what you have, this publication that would come out and for realtors to show off to their past clients, just to stay in front of them. And most of them would only send it like once a year. And it was always the top dogs that did, you know, there was always a few of them and you kind of own your territory, well, not territory, but you own that address, like your address. No one else is going to be able to send you one now, as long mm. as I'm sending to you, no one else can. And so it was really, really special for realtors, but they never had anything else for entrepreneurs or service-based business owners and until recently. And, and they just came back on my radar and I was like, wait a minute, you have a business in action. Let, let me read it. Is it any good? And uh, they're like, yeah, and here's what you get to pick and choose and change. And so there yeah, you have it. I like it. (laughs) I like it. And I look forward to it. I would like to backtrack a little bit in your career. Um, As a serial entrepreneur, you just mentioned real being in real estate, you had a residential roofing business. Um, Talk to us a little bit about how you evolved over those years and what, because they all seem very different, like real estate, roofing, media, like marketing, basically like how? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I grew up as an entrepreneur's kid, which is basically code word for learn marketing early, learn proposals early, learn taxes early, uh, learn every bit of the operations early. And, um, and you know, we all have moms and dads, right. And sometimes because they've taught us or nurtured something or despite of their example, like in spite of their example, we've learned it. So I had, uh, two, you know, they, they both were uh, in business. My mom supported my dad and what he was up to. And later they divorced, but they still managed to own businesses. So no matter what home I was in or around, there was a business being run. And I was a, I was an eighties baby that was raised with my dad, a single dad. And I was usually just his little lucky charm going on to all the job sites. If you've ever seen the movie, Curly Sue, it was like that without like the scamming, <laughs> just he had his own roofing business. And so I, I learned more and more and probably by, you know, nine, 10, 11, I remember one time my dad printed me a business card. Cause I was like, dad, one day I want to have a candy store. And he was like, okay, what are you going to name it? And candy galore. And he made business cards. He would just encourage every single time, or we'd go to a vendor shop and there'd be brochures. And I'd be like, can I have one of those? And he'd be like, here's two. And, you know, I'd go home and we'd play, I'd play with my, my buddy, Donnie or Sarah. And we'd, we'd, we'd play shop. Right. And that really were the, was where the first lessons learned was I, I was seeing sales in real time. I was seeing a negotiation happen. I was seeing what goes wrong when you aren't licensed or, or in a permit goes sideways when you're on a job. And in every way, sales was always talked about. There was never a dinner conversation or if, even it was dinner on the road. Let's be frank. There was not, do not picture little Nicole and Dan sitting, you know, table prepared. They was just on the go all the time. And I found out by age 12, I loved supporting them both as entrepreneurs. I loved making sure that they had their, you know, my dad couldn't write a contract that was legible in my opinion. I was like, should you have been a doctor? He was like, oh no, couldn't do the schooling. And so that's where that started. So by the time I went to college and got my MBA, cause my dad and my mom always encouraged, go to school, go get a desk job. <laughs> this life is hard. Go do something else. Well, I did that. And, and I got, I got the bank job actually during, while well, I was still working on my uh, grad or my undergrad. And I was like, I remember, I, I remember coming to both of them and saying, I know why you don't do this. This is the worst. Like I'm in a <laughs> hole all day. This is the worst. Yeah. There's a reason why you don't do this for your life. The freedom and flexibility that you have. Sure. Sometimes you, I wasn't sure where lunch money came and then lunch showed up at 11 o'clock in the day, but, um, you had the freedom and flexibility to be there, to parent me, to be with my sibling. Anyway. And so that's really how it all began. So when I finished up my MBA, the market was crashing. I did all the things that I was told to do, right? Went to school, got the MBA, got the jobs. It worked in some corporate, um, grew to a three-state territory with corporate. And then I was like, wait a minute, the recession just happened. I, we bought a house to flip for our own life. We, everything started crumbling. And I was like, well, there's one thing I can count on is I know how to sell. I know how to market. And so I knew I couldn't take over my dad's business. It was messy. I couldn't do it. So I was like, well, I'll start my own. And so that's what I did. I became the only female licensed contractor in our area, licensed roofing contractor, I should say. There were other GCs that were female for sure. And um, I, I was never swinging a hammer. Let me be really clear. That's where, that's where I think the, it feels so big and different. Uh, but instead, I was out there doing sales, doing marketing, coaching a sales team, project managing my team the way I watched my dad since I was tiny. 
So were you competing against your dad? Were you in the same area? (laughs) Funny, we rarely came up against each other on jobs because a lot of mine were insurance-based and that was a lot of the paperwork I would have done for him. So, I mean, in some cases, but I was always just trying to bring him into the fold constantly. You know, at that age, let's see, he would have been like, I don't know, sick in his sixties. And I was just hoping that he would have done more sales and more sales coaching for my team and been a part of that. And, um, so no, we were always working together, but by and large, a lot of my stuff was either larger residential, like, you know, span of townhomes or, or insurance, because I would check all those boxes where dad was like, "Mm, just get this done on the hood of a car. You know, So okay, two different okay. styles. They didn't always compete with each other. <laughs> okay. I was imagining you like going out and him being like losing jobs to you. And I was like, how does that yeah, dynamic yeah. even work? What would happen? Yeah, no. So I do have two other uncles that are also in similar business. And occasionally one of the un- uncles and I, um, you know, it's really collaborative when you grow up this way, there are deals happening at pool parties, at dinner tables, at picnics with family, like it's always happening. So there might be someone's license in one area and you give them that job. So, um, it was never a competition. It was just more like collaboration all the time. Usually a bird dog was exchanged. Here's a hundred on that one here. I got 500 on that one. Yeah. Okay. When did you decide to leave that business and then go in and create smart cookie media or whatever your next step was? Yeah. So, um, did that <laughs> hit, hit half million really quickly, like that first year. And just was like, Oh, okay, here we are. This is, this is what we're doing. That's the 40 K 50 K months. Let's go. And then all of a sudden I remember I woke up, I would always wake up anytime the rain would hit the gutter behind my bedroom window and, and, or hail. <laughs> and my mind would first go to at, you know, four or 5.00 AM, um, whose roof is open. And we didn't ever have a practice of having roofs open. Um, but if we had been somewhere that there was a storm, their, their roof may be open until they were approved, for example. And so my mind would go to that right away. And it would be like, who's open? Or oh, wait, is that a hail? Is that hail? We got to get out. Like there wasn't the software that they have now where they can like track things. And like, you can send out postcards. It was just becoming online where you could do, you could really segment and sort that out. Instead, you, you just saw trucks show up where there were storm damage. And it was one of those times finally in that third or fourth year that I was like, I want to be a mom one day how in the world am I going to keep hearing (laughs) the pinging of the gutter when I really need to be hearing and waiting for the cry of a baby or, Oh, it's Mm. mealtime. Let me get to the baby before. Mm. And it was right at that time. Now I was the oldest of five and my mom went on uh, remarried. She She had four kids after me. And so there was a big age gap. And so I always felt like I always had kids around always, even my kid sister lived with me during college. So, so we waited a long time before having kids, but it was that time that I realized I can't do both. I can, women, we can do anything, but we literally can't do everything as much as we try. And I was like, I can't, I can't be both. I can't that that's why I can't do this. And so that Mm -hmm. was the moment that I, that I decided, and my dad wasn't fully coming into the fold. He still wanted to do whatever he was doing. And so I was like, okay, well, this isn't exactly family business. Let's see what else I want to do. And so there was a few things that came up that I couldn't refuse. And one of them was going to work in Chicago, which I always expected I would be at for a large nonprofit who did residential and commercial construction for nonprofits. It was a nonprofit serving nonprofits and also lending them money to do so. And it was like, oh, this is where I I belong. And then I got fired. Okay. I was like, well, you're not there now. So let's, let's continue. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Oh no. So I, um, yeah. So, uh, the, it was the, I, I won't say too much, except that it was the most toxic, awful experience ever on the outside, how I just painted it. It seemed like that's, that's perfect for you, you know, lending and mortgage and, you know, you know, this world of uh, construction, this would be great for you to market that. So I was um, director of marketing, but it felt like I was working in like a lab rat who's being studied for like, what are the worst ways to treat humans that work for a team. And it it just was awful. It wasn't for me. And it wasn't awful because I came, you know, and owned my own thing. It just in, in being inside of it, you could see so many people miserable, right? Like, so like being there, but having the experience of running your own thing or better leadership or better management. um, I was just terribly disappointed, but I kept my head down, stayed there for a year. Remember hiring my associate. So she's right underneath me. And she sat me down and uh, within a month of being not even a full month. And she was like, what are you doing here? (laughs) And I was like, excuse me, what? (laughs) She's like, what are you doing here? Like, this is, this is not for you. And I'm like, you've been here three weeks. You don't even know. (laughs) And I just like looked at her and I said, it's funny you asked. I said, today's, today's one year. And I I told myself I wouldn't look up till one year and you asked at a good time. So within six months, um, I had told her, she had told me, she's like, I think they'll fire you one day. 
And I was like, that would be a compliment. It really, really would. I said, I'm here for my team. Um, that would be a compliment. And little do you know, I've been packing my bags for it. was at that time when she said that I said, I've been packing my bags for a couple of weeks. Like, uh, I'm good. I'm good to go if that's the case, but I just couldn't make the leap for whatever reason. I just couldn't do it. And, um, and then, yeah, then all, <laughs> then all of a sudden I would let go itty bitty, tiny severance kind of came along with that. I was toasting out on Wacker drive. My team was crying and I was, I couldn't have been happier enterprise rented the car. Didn't even leave on a train that day. I was ready. Oh, wow. And yeah, is that ready. when you started smart cookie medium? So you ask great questions, but no, um, from there I went, I went and worked with a couple different startups. Cause I thought like, how can I still, cause I still don't have a family yet. Um, how can I, um, you know, be safe, right? Like have the corporate work as we start to figure out family. Right. And so I was like, well, I can get what I need out of working at a couple startups. And so tried that, I told them both in five years, I won't be here. That was fine with them. Right. They're more startup style. And, um, after getting fired the second time with a fatter severance, that's when I said, all right, this is my runway. This is it. Uh, baby okay. was already here oh my gosh. and that was it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a journey, but it's so interesting. I love hearing journeys like this because it shows that you can land on your feet, that it's yeah. going to be okay. And sometimes, you know, in your gut that like, this is not for me, this is not the career that it's really yeah. the journey I want to be on. Yeah. And, yeah. and now you've got this marketing company, which is doing really well. And it's so good to like, hear these like success stories you have and finding you like a niche and all that. It's just, it's just interesting. Now you did talk a little bit about like management and leadership and your experience. How do you think that's changed over your journey? And especially now in your current company? Yeah. So I believe in the quote that leadership is like beauty. It's hard to define, but you know it when you see it and being the only kid between my two parents, the, the leadership drum was beat often. My mom was really, really shy. And she would put me on stages as early as four <laughs> before, you know what I was at, at speech meets, speech, speech meet, meets. That's funny. And, um, and spelling bees and, and wherever. And so just little moments of leadership all along the way. Um, in college, I was picked up for a leadership. I had, I got to apply to this thing called the Northwest Indiana Leadership Institute. And, and there were also examples of really great leaders around me. And so it was just kind of this thing I was always paying attention to and studying, always thinking, how, how do people want to be treated? I think it's human and kind. Like, I think it's both right. Humankind. <laughs> and I, I wasn't, I was seeing it in some places and I wasn't seeing it in other places, but I knew I could be that for a team. And I knew, um, I knew I could set them up for success. And so it was just a matter of where did I want to do that at, um, in all of the career choices, it was always marketing and sales for me. Right. And it was just a matter of would leadership above me, allow me to do the things that I know would work. Would they let me experiment the way marketing is meant to be experimented with? And when I couldn't find that, you know, some places would, and some places wouldn't, when I couldn't find that, I just knew, well, then I have to do it for others. Cause if there's somebody that's going to let you, it's going to be the person that hires you and continues to, to pay you to mm -hmm. say, yes, do the thing that's going to help me grow. I trust you. And so now instead of just choosing to do it for one, I was like, let's do it for 41. Let's do it for 50. Let's do it for a hundred. And it never dawned on me before. Like, I just kept thinking like I'm doing marketing for somebody else or, or small scale myself. Now I'm like, well, no, let's just do it on steroids. I don't just have to do it for me. I can do it for others. Now you mentioned um, before when we were talking offline that you have some contractors who are working with you. Tell us some of the mistakes and challenges you've had when hiring um, yeah. just in your career, but also with your current company, with yeah. the contractors. So mistakes, um, uh, I've made a few. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so mistakes, I think it's more so challenges. I. I try not to look at any of the, any of the hires that maybe just went sideways or something as a mistake. There's always something that I've learned or something I've gathered. I remember coming in and inheriting a team and I, I can't say that I could have seen a mistake there, but looking back, um, I wish I would have said, if we're going to inherit this team, like let's do some work first. So that's a challenge that's totally different, but I felt like I didn't take the reins strong enough to say like, I got this. Um, so that was, that was a bit of a mistake or just a learning curve and, um, and just a team that wanted me there to take care of them, but then didn't act that way. Right. Oh, we got this. Oh, we got this. Um, a mistake here I would say with smart cookie is not hiring faster. I tell every entrepreneur hire faster, including myself, like hire faster, hire before you're ready, take a page cut, live leaner, whatever you got to do, but hire faster. Um, in the past, I didn't have clear, a lot of people call them SOPs. I want to remove that language from it because I think it's jargon, but I didn't have clear boundaries 
of how far somebody could run. Like, here's your fence post, like keep going when you get there. If you need to check in, check in, right. Like, and likely check in, or here's where I want you to check in. But the mistake was, I didn't realize sometimes that people don't, they don't just appreciate that because they know when to check in, but they're having all of their doubts and worries that they're not performing anyway along the way. So how to support them on the mile markers, right? So in my house, we have a white fence post. It looks like a ranch style, you know, like maybe something you see on rolling hills and there mm -hmm. are those, those fence posts, right? And so how to make sure that someone has either, we do a lot of loom videos here. It says, Hey, here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. You don't have to ask me for permission until we get to here. Um, so I didn't always do that in either my previous business or with previous teams in a way that now my team, I know I'm quieting their own inner voice of like, am I getting it right? Am I, get I wasn't thinking that before I was thinking like, just go, but they're, they're already having those challenges along the way. And now we solve them so much better. Another challenge, um, that I never considered, but had people do like personality tests, you know, like, Hey, where mm. you fit in with the team? Or I love, you know, um, strengths finder. I love, you know, any, any of the ones pick one. I love them. Um, but it hasn't been until, um, last, uh, I don't know, a year or so ago, I went through something called clockwork. Mike McCallowitz has a book called run like clockwork. There's a program, there's a thing and, um, went through that. And one of the things I took away was creating a user manual who cares that you took that test for strength finder? Do you agree with it? And so we have each buddy, everybody individually write their user manual. Like, here's what I agree. This is what I took away. Oh my gosh, this is spot on. When we get in a situation like this, I need this from you, or I need this from management, or I need this from coworkers. So that way we don't have to understand every bit of the Briggs Meyer on you. We barely understand our own fully, right? Instead, it's this condensed user manual that, that um, yes, even though they're contractors, I have them write up so we can all work better together. I, I have all my contractors write up user manuals and some people do it. like an amazing job. And then some people have to come keep going back and say, no, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Imagine like I, yes. you moved to Bali and I had to step in and like, let's try yes. to get more meat out of this. Yes. And it's about themselves or it's about their work. Um, it can be both. It's okay. generally not about themselves. Actually. It's usually how okay. working with me working yeah, with me, yeah. like how, how, okay. like Kiri might ask for this. And then this is what she means. Or when Kiri is saying like, <laughs> like almost like this yeah. translation. Yes. I manual. love it. Oh, yeah. Fun. So it's not, oh my gosh. it's a little it's different. My... I mean, and of course yeah. it's their work. There's, there's tons on their work in there, but there is a yes. little bit about like, this is how you work with Kiri and what she really means. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I think it comes back, it like comes from my EA background when I was an executive assistant, I would yeah. have to create these manuals. And then like, if I went on the kitchen, the other assistant in the office had to, you know, understand and take over. And that was always like, Ooh, these are very distinct personalities. How do I handle them? And how do I, so like, that's, that's, I think part of it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Good. We might have to, yeah. Team, if you're listening, let's add, let's add in some of that. When Nicole says this, she means, yeah, but no, usually this is about them. Um, you know, somebody needs the details. And while I pre I do, I appreciate details. And some of my team members have said, well, Nicole, you're keen on the details. Am I? I, I do appreciate details, but I'm not necessarily, I, I hire for someone to take care of details. And so in that detailed person's user manual, it'll say, sometimes I'll ask a whole lot of questions. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I realize I may need to ask for a meeting, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's just about questions. So, mm -hmm. um, so things like that are inside of hers. How do you think your mindset changed over when, especially when you had your residential roofing business and you were growing and it sounds like it was such a rapid growth. How did your mindset change over those years? So I think first it was about leverage. So I had come from a commission background in, in sales. So I was, I did, um, mortgage, I was a mortgage loan originator for years before that. And I was able to always grow my commission based on my own network. So it was just this reminder of, you know, you could have two people sitting in a cubicle and they make, they make, make the difference between a dollar of each other. Right. Um, but when I kept moving up in my commission levels, because of my own network, my own doing my own growing my network, which is basically hello marketing, making sure people in your network know what you do. I realized just the power of leverage that then when I hopped over and decided I was going to build a residential roofing business and, and get people to take me seriously, it was going to need to be, how can I leverage what I know to grow a network fast? Because it was much bigger than just my own personal network, right? It was all of Northwest Indiana. I needed to make sure, you know, at least three counties knew what we were up to and how could I do that? So I think the mindset shift was like, oh, I can do this incrementally with levels 
or I can, I can do this on steroids Mm -hmm. and realizing I I only have that answer. No one, no one else is going to have that answer for me, especially, you know, there's, there's no guys in roofing that were like handing out answers back then. There was no group coaching. There's no mastermind. There's no, nothing like that. So, so I think that was one of the big things is my unique ability in figuring out how do I leverage that even more? Um, from there, I, th- I think the next, um, the next involvement has been, well, if you can do that, what does it mean? Can you double down? What, what else, what else can you do? How, how else can you refine that and understand that for others? So now in this case, it's not just about one and done this business, you know, like mm. just the roofing business now it's, well, how can we get really good at yeah, here, but now we want to get really good for others as well. Cause I believe in the power of referrals. Well, I don't want that to be anybody's marketing plan. Cause that that's a fickle marketing plan for you. And yes, it's good. And yes, they come really warmed up, but people are people is what I say. So they got their own stuff and they're going to get distracted and busy that I wanted to make sure we had a really solid foundational way to do that same growth for others. And so it was just one more time figuring out, okay, what are the pieces people can really leverage? Mm. I like that a lot. What do you think has been the best investment you've made and the worst investment? Let me have a second. Let's see. Well, the worst investments are always the ones that I don't take seriously. and I don't follow through. I believe what you put in is what you get out, right? Um, the best investments are always every single time without fail. Uh, they're always something to grow my own know how my own, right? Like it's not necessarily techie things, but it's always something that's going to push me and push me. Um, like, but I like personal but, development or just even learning a new software. Um, I want to give you like one that's like, Ooh, this was, this was the highlight. So let's see. I mean, one of the best ones was a $68,000 home that we bought when we weren't even engaged yet. Like, I think we knew we were right for each other, but like that house um, we've been able to, you know, from that little tiny start and it's just terribly ugly. I should post a picture sometime, just like where we started. Like that was probably the best investment because it forced my husband and I to work together. We got engaged inside that house. Like he didn't do anything elaborate. There was no hot air balloons folks, but, but it was just so meaningful. So I, I would say like that investment, like was tied up so many things, um, in a work relationship with him and being a team, um, getting things done. My hands still ache when I think about refinishing those floors, but like in terms of investment, that little tiny $68,000 house that was just part money pit, part, uh, it all worked out in the end. Um, that was probably one of the best ones. Um, the second one, I really loved working with clockwork because it helped me think through systems differently than I had before that I just kept making some of them harder and they didn't have to be. So I would say that if there was a personal development one, that would be it. So you, clockwork, you said it was like a book, but is it also a course or like a learning yeah, they, platform or yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah, they have a program. And I didn't know that when I had the book, okay. when I read the, or I was audible. And then sure enough, at some point their ads chased me around the internet and I did their like boot camp, And I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, Mike's behind this. And he has somebody that's like really behind it. And she, um, she's really, really powerful in what, and what she knows when it comes to systems and running like clockwork. And yeah, so you spend a year with them learning all of these systems with the goal or promise to take four weeks off. Um, but my goal and my promise for myself had always been just to only work three or four days a week to start a podcast. Mm. So then I only had to work three days a week and grow the business the way I wanted to. And so, so many of those systems I use today and have helped me in, in so many, so many different ways, helping me hire people easier, faster. I can get 400 applications in for something I want to hire for. And the six will just like emerge because mm. of going through that. So, um, so that's probably like the best coursework I've ever done. Okay. I'm going to put that in the show notes, the book and the program. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you think you stand out from your competitors with smart cookie media? Hmm. The big thing is, is I don't want anybody to be held hostage. So many marketing agencies, I'll put them on blast, even though I love supporting them and love working with them, but so many marketing agencies, uh, you know, they come from maybe scarcity mindset or just an old school mindset of, of, they're going to, you know, our clients are going to pay us monthly. They're just going to stick with us. And so because they have that monthly retainer that maybe it's a year contract, they've already built, built in and baked in. I hear from customers prospects, right? Cause they're locked into contracts sometimes. So sometimes they're not, they're not even able to be a client with me. Um, they are held hostage either by their web developer. Cause they don't have access to log in either by their, whoever it is. And I, I just, I want nothing to do with that. I want someone to have a tether to me 
that we can work together. This isn't a grown up relationship. <laughs> this is, this should be a yin yang works for you, works for us. And, um, and that's the big difference that I don't see out there. So many people, um, are just held hostage by whatever their vendor has, whatever contract they put them in, instead of being like, I can't wait to see what Nicole's going to teach me next or what she's going to offer next or what she's going to do next, because I know it's going to grow my business. I think that's a big difference. I did have someone on my, um, podcast, Nancy Erickson. She was, she's a book publisher and she was talking about how her worst investment was a marketing company and they like held her hostage and it was like so much money spent with zero results. She said zero results. And she's like, I know you can't prove or say like, I'm going to get you these, but you know, you hire them with a a hope that they provide something. Right. Right. So if you don't have these long-term contracts, then what are, are your contract? What does that look like? Is that shorter timeframe? So we month have month? And until, until this year, we've done a month to month hotline okay. where we will support unlimited support. So you have a question, you need a template, you need a resource. How do I do a flash sale? Uh, would you look at this Google ad? We just solved some of those things for somebody. Somebody else wanted to do a flash sale for July. Somebody else wanted to offer a new mini, um, you know, kind of like a VIP day sort of thing for their industry. Um, any of that support someone else. I mean, she's a photographer who wants to do a workshop and she's like, Hey, what are the steps? And we get to coach her every single step of the way month to month, cancel anytime you want to be here three months. Cool. You want to be here six months. Cause you're like, wow, I am squeezing out every single thing, get full access to all of our resources, which is very different. Right. So again, it's just a tether. You can be here as long as you want to be here. We're happy to have you. Um, but at least it's this clear way of you're going to get exactly what you want and it's on your time. So it's all asynchronous. So it's not like, Oh, wait for the zoom call. Oh, wait for the coaching Mm. call. Okay. Watch it on the replay. This is what do you need? We're going to meet you right where you are. Um, so that that's been the big thing that we've done, but in the past, it's just been meet with the day, get 30 days support. And then people just kept coming back. Right. So they need, they need ads, but I tell them after we hit 50 leads, I want you to come back and I want you to get another VIP day for email nurturing, because if we just prove the messages that they'll convert on, they're not all going to buy. I can Mm -hmm. prove the messages that they're going to convert on via your email. We already did that work. So let's now get six months of emails ready to go. And so it's just been, instead, they're on a roadmap with us. When they're ready for that next step, they take that next step and do that next VIP day. That is different. I think (laughs) for most marketing companies, for sure. Okay. So let's, let's just talk about briefly, where do you, where do you see your business going next five years, say maybe even next two years? So Smart Cookie Media was named Media for a reason, and which I'm excited to share that with you because your background's in media. We weren't called Smart Cookie Marketing uh, on purpose because media opens doors that marketing agency can't. Now, I knew could, we could grow fast with marketing, but likely we're going to see it go uh, two, two different directions. Not different, complementary. Uh, one is giving people the power of all of their data in one place. So we use something called Clipfolio to create a dashboard of all the things, whoever, wherever you got your stuff, right? Whether you have social media, whether you have email platforms, whether you have Google analytics, maybe you have a Calendly link, maybe where all of your traffic's coming in. Um, right now, I'm going to guess a lot of people, they're not, they're not number nerds, right? And so they're like going in and looking and then like, okay, check. Okay. They're going in and looking and check. But what if, what if we had the power, just like when we drive in a car to see it at a glance as a business owner and as a visionary to, to move forward quickly, to take our foot off the gas, to, to, to go a little faster. So we want to, we want to give those dashboards to people. So number one, it takes us, you know, we can still provide marketing services, but it allows us to be an advisor to whatever marketing you do have, whether that person is, or isn't doing something for your business, whether it is a big goose egg, can you, what if we can prove it to you faster, not for our own gain or, or whether we can coach them in like, Hey, you know, we do Google ads. Um, we're phasing them out more and more. So like, if you are working with a Google ads rep, we can say like, Hey, here, this is why you should invest more money with them. Like go spend a few more dollars. Cause this mm-hmm. is, this is the return. And maybe you couldn't see it before. Um, and then the other one will be producing podcasts. So we've already produced our first, it hasn't launched out there yet in the world, but mind your money podcast will be out soon enough. So you're going to see us producing a whole lot more as well for others, awesome. not just for ourselves. Awesome. Yeah. Tell us what advice do you have for other women as they grow their business and they want to reach seven figures? Invest in your investments. Mm. That's the big one. Mm-hmm. What hurdles have you specifically faced, do you think, growing and running businesses as a woman? Oh, as a woman. Um, so so showing up to um, any building department, getting a permit <laughs> um, wasn't always treated 
fairly seriously. I don't want to say fairly, but whatever. Um, but seriously, right. They, they either thought I was an assistant or they thought I didn't take the exam or that I didn't, um, hold the keys and rightfully so, because on my business card, I made sure I was no dummy. I put on their project manager. No one needed to know where the buck stopped. I let them think that there was some other boss all the time. Um, but that was a hurdle. Like I chose that on purpose to be incognito, whether I was with a client, I was like, Hey, if you can get this done tonight, I got 500 bucks. I know, I know the boss will approve. You can sign it and it would work. Like it felt, it felt, it felt crazy, but I would watch somebody who didn't respect my position potentially as owner. And I just used that to my advantage and said like, Hey, we can get it done. I, I know, I know I get 500 bucks off. And before you know it, they're like, Oh yeah. Okay, great. Um, so those, those were some of the things just not being treated like, like I deserved a seat at the table, even though I did all the same thing that those guys did. Now, in some cases, I wasn't up there slinging shingles, for example, so they could feel what they could feel about it. But I sure as heck could draw it, show you the science, everything behind it, and convince you why one material is better over it over another. So that was a problem. Moving forward, as a woman, though, um, there there have been conversations people should not have with you in corporate specifically. Um, I remember somebody saying. Um, I've always had um, an opportunity to work from home ever way before the world changed. And I remember someone saying like, I just need to know that you have care for your child when you are working at home. It is none of your business. Um, heck yeah, I have care. Like the, clearly dad, you've never had a toddler running around the house or a baby who needs to be nursed or like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but those, those were lines. I'm like, you would never ask, like my husband would never be asked the question. Do you have care for the kids? Well, while you're working today. Yeah. Yeah. You would never be asked that question. So some of those, but I'll tell you in, in, in all of those though, the benefits far away, right. Mm -hmm. It's, it is saying I need this time or, or yeah, I'm, I'm going to take, you know, the reason why I shut down a million dollar business was because of the wealth and value I get out of having and growing a family. Like you can't put a dollar on that. Um, today I, my, my kiddo said something about why moms are strong. Like, I'll tell you why moms are strong <laughs> when you're older. <laughs> and I was like, we do things that, that dads would never do. Don't worry, kiddo. So I like that. Um, it's funny. I have a story where my daughter, I have tried so hard to like create this lifestyle business so I can be with her with her. And this was probably two years ago, two or three years ago. And my sister is a teacher and her husband's a stay-at-home dad, or he he does some work uh, part-time, but it's all from home. Um, and my daughter said to me, and I'd been working on this business for years so I could have a family, have them home. And she goes, mama, you should just get a job like Auntie Zara, and then you can make money. And I'm like, why has this totally gone over your head? Like, yes, right. You see me on like, I'm like, oh, I have a client call. I need to do like, she sees me where I thought it was going in there, but she was just like, no, you got to get yeah. a job to make money. Oh. And I'm like, oh. Oh. how old is she? How old is now she? Now she's seven. Now she's seven. Okay. She, now now she understands more. I think that was like, yes. she's four or five yeah, around there. Yes. Yes. I was just yes. like, you know, hitting my head on the wall, like all this work I've done to show you that yes. like I can do so much and I can like, and no. Yes. Hoping oh that it head. gets in, especially for okay. little girls. Yeah. My, my little guy, my mom taught him, she, she would watch him. He was, I don't know. He was, I don't know, one and a half to just barely talking. And she taught him a line that later some spammer on the internet, um, totally, totally warped it, but he, she would teach him just tell mama, go make that money, honey, because yeah. he, was so upset when I'd leave to go downstairs to work. I got to go to work now. Why do you got to go to work? Why you got to work? Right. Well, <laughs> uh, there's a few reasons. Um, and, and so she would teach him that line, go make that money, honey. So that he would be excited for like, Oh yeah, go make it. And he is the kid that now, um, we are saving for Disney. We're going to Disney in November. And so I'm teaching them about saving. We have this like see-through bank so mm. they can see the money and the Mickey Mouse mm. gift cards and the, and, um, and I sold something on Facebook marketplace. I don't bring my kids outside when I sell something on Facebook marketplace guy was nice. We chatted. He's an entrepreneur, of course. And so we chatted for a few minutes. Apparently he owns the local ice cream truck. So we, we chatted far too long for my two-year-old came back in. He is sobbing mess. And I show him like, Hey, here's the 45 bucks I got. And he was like, Oh, and I go, what, how much do you think we should go put in the Disney fund? Half of it. And he was like, Nope. And he just shoved it all in. Yeah. And it, and I, you know, and part of me is like, okay, that's going to backfire one day. Like he's going to value money too much, but he just didn't understand that that was what the transaction was, but he understood like, oh, this is what you were up to. Now I understand. And now I know where it goes. Um, so like, yeah, you hope that it doesn't, it doesn't backfire. That's all I hope. <laughs> 
I will say this, this is helpful for me. And I'm going to do this with my son when he's older, but my daughter would have trouble with when I, when I went downstairs to work too. And, you know, I have to work. And then finally I translated, I said, this is fun for me. I love yes. doing this. You know, you love playing with your toys. This is what I love to do. It's yeah. just all on a computer, but this is really fun. This is my playtime. And that actually yes. helped her work around. Oh, like you're not it. leaving me. You're doing something you love. Yeah. So I, was, I don't know if that's going to work with my son, who knows, but it worked with my daughter. <laughs> oh, anyway, I, love um, I may try that. Share with us, where can we find you, your website, social media handles, anything if people are interested in connecting with you. Yeah, for sure. So smartcookiemedia.co, not .com. Uh, I also hang out on LinkedIn and Instagram all the time. You can find me on LinkedIn, Nicole Schmied. Uh, Instagram is also Nicole underscore Schmied. And Facebook is probably one of my most common places to be if I'm going live or I'm sharing a new tool. You can find me there at Smart Cookie Entrepreneurs. Great. Thank you. What is one philosophy, mantra, or quote you try to run your business by? It's always impossible. It always feels impossible until it is done. Oh. I like that. Nelson, it's so Nelson true Mandela. for everything. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. All Somebody right, else said so. to me recently, uh, work it till it works. I'm like, oh, I think that's the same, the same concept. Work it till it work works. It. it is, but, but yours is more eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on this interview, Nicole. And if you're in the audience and listening to this show, if you found it informative and valuable, do us a little favor and share it so we can help grow this show. Um, even if you have to open their podcast app on their phone, please just make these people listen to this awesome interview with Nicole. They'll thank you for it. So until next time, you can find me on LinkedIn or tag me on Instagram at virtuallycurie. So thank you again, Nicole. <laughs>